The year is 1999. The new millennium is nearly upon us, the Matrix is in theaters, and a young Ariel Pink has found himself in trouble at CalArts for... basically the large-scale equivalent of drawing dicks on a final exam. In spite of this, though, he couldn't be doing better. In fact, to a young Ariel Pink, it feels as though all of the puzzle pieces are beginning to fall into place. You see, Ariel has always thought of music as his calling. He can remember being 10 or 11 and percussively clicking his tongue in time to his favorite pop songs on the radio. The only thing holding him back was a seeming lack of direction. He started out mimicking the 80s pop he was sired on, experimenting with tapes, eventually evolving on to create purposefully bad music in his teens as a sort of stereotypical art kid rebellion against the commercialization of music. Cute. Things came to a head in 1997, when Ariel found a vinyl copy of this weird red and green album with a screaming face on it called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About R. Stevie Moore But Were Too Afraid to Ask. The album is a kind of revelation to him. Mr. Moore here was making pop rock songs in basically every style, defying genre cliches and feeling more like a radio show than a cohesive album. He spent the next year immersing himself in Moore's ethos, his recording style, and this newly opened up world of music around him. Ariel's been recording music for some time now, and 1999 has nearly come to an end. He's proud to have put together an entire album in just his dorm room, but he craves something more. Something he can't quite put his finger on. It's a new year, and Ariel has just begun his penultimate semester at CalArts, a semester which will inevitably drop the pen and become his final as he drops out. This time, Ariel has learned not to draw a bunch of prudish professors packing each other's pussies, and instead has spent all of his energy on music. Ariel puts the finishing touches on what he sees as a magnum opus, the doldrums. Ariel goes as far as to have the tapes professionally mastered to CD in a studio on campus. As his thesis project, he sets up a stand selling handmade CD copies of the doldrums as a commentary on the over-commercialization of the American education system? I don't know. I don't listen to Godspeed, you black emperor. Sorry. Anyway, to his abject horror, no one finds his selling of his own music to be insightful or deep. Disheartened, Ariel drops out to become a recluse, but not before doing one last thing. He makes an email account and sends a low bitrate digital copy to Moore's Code, the legendary R. Stevie himself. Not sure if he'll even hear back, Ariel finishes up the paperwork. Surprisingly, he gets a response back almost immediately. Stevie is impressed. Furthermore, he'd love to meet Ariel and maybe even collaborate. This energizes Ariel. He moves into the lowest rent space he could find and sets off to record a grand double album. An album to rival Stevie's best work. Pure. Shredded, drugged up, insane pop tunes fueled by nothing but raw emotion and a devotion to the craft. This is the story of that album, and the profound effect it had on a community of internet weirdos who were never even given a chance to purchase it. This is the story of Ariel Pink's Haunted Graffiti 3 and 4, Scared Famous slash Fast Forward. <laughs> When I set out to make this video, I knew bits and pieces, anecdotes here and there about the making of the album, but I spared no expense and went straight to the source. I sent Ariel Pink himself a message, begging him to tell me anything that could be helpful about the making of this album. And he never got back to me. I went to R. Stevie Moore, someone whose very being is tied to the soul of this album. And he didn't really have anything to tell me, to be honest. I went to Slugbug, someone whose knowledge of Ariel's taping and history is unparalleled thanks to his work on the Archives Project. And he kind of dodged my question and went on with the conversation. I'll be honest, guys, I was getting kind of demoralized here. I didn't want this to just be some shitty little six-minute video where I gave a bunch of did you know gaming facts about the album and that was it. I wanted it to be something special. And that was when it occurred to me. The making of this album, the recording surrounding it, that's only a bit of the story, a fraction of what it really means to me. Also included that tale are what the album means for myself personally, and how it influenced a generation of creators on the internet still going to this very day. And that's the story I want to tell. 
Yes, of course, this album has a fantastic history to it that I hope to do some justice to in this video, but also I want to explore the scene that's cropped up from this album. To fully understand this album, we first need to understand where it comes from. The Ariel Pink of 2001 was a very different man from the one we think of today. In place of the long, flowing dyed hair and sparkling sequin suits, lived a reclusive 20-something with short, naturally brunette hair, gray sweatpants, and whichever color of ragged, tattered jacket he decided that day. He didn't have much of a life yet. He was still trying to find his footing in a brand new town. During this period, Ariel's days consisted mainly of two things. He would leave in the morning and go to work at his job as a record store clerk. Then, after he was through with that, having nowhere else to go, Ariel would head back to his tiny apartment in a communal living space above an ashram. At this time, his whole life was music. The music he'd loved as a child, the music that moved him that he discovered through his new job, and the music that he was trying to make. Ariel would discover new albums through his job and pore over the liner notes to look for all their special thanks and influences. He would then dig into those influences and see where those liner notes took him. In a pre-internet world, this was the closest thing Ariel could get to diversifying his tastes through, say, rate your music as we would nowadays. Upon hearing this, one might wonder where Ariel's lyrics came from exactly. There are many musicians and creatives in general who will tell you that their writing comes from life experience. And in fact, there's a large subset of people on the internet right now, people who I'm convinced have never had a creative thought in their entire life, who believe that you can't write about something you've never experienced. In this sense, Ariel's music of the time stands in direct opposition to this sentiment. I remember around 2016, I had messaged Ariel Pink on Twitter, asking him about the song 22 Eyes, and if it came from some real-life shitty relationship he was in, and Ariel Pink replied telling me that all of his songs didn't come from life experience, they were written directly in spite of it. In the early 2000s, Ariel may have been an outcast who had little semblance of a life, but this wasn't a hurdle to overcome in writing his music, it directly contributed to it. Ariel Pink's music didn't come from some life experience. It's far greater music than any life experience could create. In fact, I think that at the time, if Ariel did have a normal outlet such as friends or parties to go to, then he wouldn't have had all these thoughts and feelings swirling around in his head. This music, this incredible double album that is Scared Famous and Fast Forward, they come from all of these feelings with no outlet, compressed into this otherworldly space goop that's been burned to a CD. Scared Famous and Fast Forward are not a portrait of the world Ariel was living in. Instead, they're a musical transcription of what his world felt like, how it felt to be in his head. There's an interview that was conducted for the liner notes of the Ariel Archives reissues, where Ariel states that sometimes he would just, in the moment, scratch down whatever lyrics he felt went best to a track, and then after that he would decide to never revise them to keep them as this sort of preserved fossil of where his mind was. This approach, I think, leads to what I love so much about this album. It feels like Ariel's bearing his soul in the song's lyrics. Each of the songs you can tell comes from part of him. Even the songs that are, as he said, written in spite of life experience, songs like 22 Eyes or more psychedelic and abstract tunes like Gopa Kapu Ko, still come from deep within Ariel's soul. Songs like Where Does the Mind Go, The Lament of Edward Boggles, and Death Crush 99 are all about how weird and bizarre and separate from humanity Ariel felt. The loneliness Ariel felt spurring from this isolation is delved into on tracks like A Tomb All Your Own, Privacy, and Inmates of Heartache. Yet this feeling of aloneness hasn't made Ariel bitter. The album is still peppered with syrupy saccharine love songs like Talking All of the Time. Throughout the album, you see bits and pieces bleeding through of his own influences. Of course, there are the R. Stevie Moore covers. A few of the tracks across the double album are even built upon R. Stevie Moore songs, all from a 1985 tape called Skeletons, comprised of ambient instrumentals and basic drum tracks. I think during the making of this album, Ariel felt a certain kinship with R. Stevie. R. Stevie was always using his music as this sort of scream out into the void to try and find people like him, Stevie himself feeling like a total outcast in his own hometown. Throughout his early output, R. Stevie made sometimes cynical and sometimes sincere pleas for people to follow his example and do what he did. The song Copy Me off of 1978's Pow Wow seems a particularly poignant example. 
However, with the release of 1985's Skeletons, R. Stevie was truly throwing down the gauntlet, and Ariel had truly risen to the occasion. Over the years, Ariel was always recording his own songs in his own time, recording in a variety of styles, and constantly arranging and rearranging these songs into albums, sometimes creating fake song titles and even fake album titles and album artwork based on this. In some ways though, Scared Famous and Fast Forward would be his first attempt at truly creating a cohesive album. Floating around the internet, you could find a sketch outlining an early track list for the then titled Scared Famous double album. On this track list, we can see Ariel carefully conceptualizing the placement of songs, thinking about which ones fit together in style and vibe, trying to pair together long and short songs in an ebb and flow that sounds like something of a cohesive album, and overall trying to create a more ambitious work, one that feels like a truly singular work. In the past, Ariel had received help from friends, whether they be like John Mouse on Underground, almost a member of the band, or just friends offering inspiration or instrumentation here and there. But none of that would be heard on Scared Famous and Fast Forward. It would be a truly singular work, chronicling Ariel's thoughts and feelings in ways he only knows how to do. Because of this, the album also really sounds like nothing out there. It's the ultimate piece of outsider art. Ariel was making it with no inspiration, no connection to the outside world. World, just art made completely from his thoughts and feelings and what he was into at the time. Oftentimes, people will make what they call outsider art and they're trying to go directly against the grain. But really, that's still art influenced by what's popular. After all, working directly in spite of something is still feeling its influence. Ariel wasn't concerned with following the trends or going against them for that matter. He was simply just being. And I think that's what makes this album and all of his early Haunted Graffiti work feel so pure. Ariel wasn't trying to do anything. He was simply just doing. He was pressing records, sitting down, working through the night, and tabbing down the space goop that was coming out of his head. Sometimes Ariel would lay tracks down note by note, recording and re-recording when he didn't think a chord change felt right. It's arcane. It's absurd to think about. And there will never be another album like it. And and I absolutely adore it. Over the album's near 14 month recording period from early September 2000 to late October 2001, some 50 to 100 songs were written and recorded. 40 of these songs, if you count the intro as its own song, were used on this original sequence, and some of the others were re-recorded for future albums like House Arrest. Others would be re-recorded years later, like the still unreleased Right Hand Left Hand, which would become the song Pink Slime on 2012's Mature Themes. And and some others we still haven't heard, seemingly never touched again by Ariel. But I have a hard time believing these never found their way into the rest of his work. Ariel once described his songs to me as being like sketches that he was constantly drawing over and revising. In truth, in his later work, when Ariel would remake older songs, this wasn't just him trying to cash in on old ideas or having run out of ideas completely. These songs of his were always germinating and gestating in his mind, constantly being written and rewritten. Eventually, over this 14-month period, Ariel would assemble an album he was happy with, an album to truly rival R. Stevie's greatest classics. However, its final finishing touch would come at the end of October of that year. On October 25th, 2001, R. Stevie played a very bizarre, very somber small music festival in New York City, mere weeks after the Twin Towers had fallen, to an audience who, let's just say, wasn't ready for that kind of music yet. Going to remove myself tonight, that's alright. Seriously, seriously, watch the footage on YouTube, it's fucking fantastic. But anyway, Ariel was there in the audience viewing this, and in fact he and Stevie had long planned to meet up after this show and stay with each other. Late at night after the show had ended, Ariel and Stevie would, I assume, go back to Stevie's place? I couldn't really find anyone talking about where they went, but like, I assume they went to Stevie's place, unless they like, stayed in a hotel or something, but that would be even weirder. But like, Stevie lived a state over, which is still kind of weird, but like, I guess that makes sense if they had been long planning to meet up. But anyway, after the show, they finally met up, I think at Stevie's. The next day, October 26, 2001, Ariel and Stevie would spend the whole day writing and recording. 
Out of those sessions, Stevie Pink JavaScript was born. And you know who else was born that day, October 26, 2001? Me, ViewBob. And someday, I will die. Over the course of the first section of this video, I've continually stated what a wonderful and ambitious project this is. And in truth, while discussing the making of this video, I can only explain that so much. To get to the root of why I really love this album so much, we need to talk about what the album means to me, what it's meant to me my whole life and how it's evolved. And for that, we need to segue into the second section of this video. I often find myself talking at length to whoever will listen about how Scared Famous slash Fast Forward is my favorite album of all time, how it changed my life. And while certainly a lot of that life-changing quality it had for me is owed to the fact that there's nothing quite like it, no album that really sounds just like it, hell, during the making of this video I learned the metallic buzzing synthesizer sound that sits at the heart of this album's unique feel was made by taking a synth-based preset on Ariel Pink's Cassie CZ101 keyboard and pitching it up as far as it would go so it sounded like a soloing instrument. But perhaps even more of the album's effect and lasting appeal to me comes from where I mentally was at the time when I first heard it. I like to joke that Pink Floyd were my only friends throughout middle school, but that's kind of more true than I'd like to admit most of the time. For nearly all of my grade school career up until college, I was very bullied and isolated, a total social untouchable. I always felt very out of place and very weird compared to the people around me. And just as I was starting to enter into high school in the mid-2010s, that it's okay to be weird, we're all weird, let your unique weird quirky qualities out, you weird little weirdo. But in reality, this fashionable idea of weirdness was just like, I'm a guy and don't like watching sports ball? Golly gee, I'm so weird. And of course, it was all completely fashion based, so I felt even more isolated and alone. It was just around the time that this was really starting to take off that I decided I needed to branch out from Pink Floyd and find other music that gave me the same feeling. I was asking around to friends and on musical forums for other music that was in particular like Sid Barrett, and someone recommended to me Ariel Pink as Pom Pom had just come out at the time. I remember listening to it through a couple of times and thinking it was good music but not being really impressed. However, a few of those songs really stuck in my head, and I found myself compulsively googling Ariel Pink and searching for him on YouTube. My hair in ninth grade was as long as it's ever been, longer than I usually wear it, it went a little bit past my shoulders. And I used to have these shitty early wireless earbuds that still had a wire running between the two earbuds, so what I used to do to escape the classes that I absolutely hated, I would pop them in and cover it with my hair. This is probably the reason I'm now an English major who has a YouTube channel where he talks about Ariel Pink. Kids pay attention in your science class. So one day when the class was starting up on a day where I particularly couldn't take all the bullying and stress, I decided to pop my earbuds in and look up Ariel Pink on YouTube. The first search result on that day happened to be an album that I had never seen before, one with a cover that particularly intrigued me. This was an upload of Fast Forward in full. I remember the cover just intrigued me so much it seemed so bizarre and foreign. This cutout of some little man singing on what almost looked like a desert background. I loaded the album up and remember actually putting my hand over my mouth to keep myself from giggling when I heard the bizarre, silly narrations introducing the album over these weird, twinkly keyboards. And then, Where Does the Mind Go came in, and it melted my brain. At this moment, my life was irrevocably changed. I remember just hearing this instrumental drumbeat in the background, something that I didn't even know music could sound like at the time, and this small blonde man singing as though he were exercising a demon. The lyrics were bizarre and stupid and silly and sounded completely removed from the world and kind of sounded exactly how I felt. I. Even now, I'm on like my 12th take of this section of the voiceover. I can't find the words to describe it, but it just clicked in a way nothing had before and really nothing has since. The most important thing that I got from it though, communicated completely without words, was who Ariel Pink was as a person. It seemed to be telepathically telling me that Ariel Pink was someone who didn't care about what other people might expect of him or what sort of stereotypes people might force on whatever group they see him as belonging as. 
Ariel Pink was simply a person who was himself. He simply was. And in that moment, I knew that was what I wanted to be too. When I would listen to the rest of the album, dig into the rest of his discography, and even read early interviews with him, it only solidified his feeling and it showed me the kind of person I wanted to be. Over that class period, I'd listen to probably another third of the album before getting paranoid that my teacher could tell I wasn't paying attention and turning it off, and then over that day, I'd proceed to burn the album to CD and spend the rest of that night playing the album over and over again on my small CD player. 22 Eyes was another quick favorite of mine. It was such a fast, rockin' tune, probably one of the hardest that I was into at the time, and I was just addicted to it. It was the first Ariel Pink song that I knew all of the lyrics to, and I would just sing them to myself over and over again when I was walking through the hallways at school. Are You Gonna Look After My Boys is a song that it took me a long time to come around on, and to be completely honest with you, I'm still just kind of meh on Inmates of Heartache, but still, they seem to only add to the album. These tracks that were by all means just throwaways to me seemed to only add to the album's character and personality. It seemed to make it feel more human, more alive, and made me feel even more in love with it. The next song on Fast Forward, however, Make Room for Harry, was an instant hit with me. I remember it clearly. You see, my family has a long going back tradition of doing pizza nights every Friday night, which coincidentally was the day that I discovered this album. So naturally, after school let out, I was in the car with my dad on the way to the pizzeria, and I decided to load up the rest of Fast Forward on my phone. As Make Room for Harry blared through my headphones, me hearing it for the first time, I stared out the window. The sun was going down, the day turning into dusk, and the first snow of the season was falling around me. I watched out the window in wonder as the cold white blanketed the earth around me, and Make Room for Harry almost felt like it was what was keeping me warm and keeping me safe from the weather outside. It felt as though I was in a thin but very cozy log cabin looking out at the world around me. It also helped that the song really rocked and was actually really funny. It's one of the first times I really remember laughing at a song I liked. One of the only lines I could make out on that first listen was, Oh, now you've done, now Harry's come back again, oh no! And I felt this sort of exhilarating feeling giggling to myself about it, looking around as if someone was about to catch me laughing at some perverse joke I wasn't supposed to. My dad returned to the car, pizza in tow, almost completely on cue with the song ending. Driving home, I felt myself unwind with the slow beginning of the list, but it built to this triumphant crescendo that felt fitting for bringing my favorite meal of the week home. The next three songs on the record, My Molly, Howlin' at the Moon, and Beef Bud, were another three that I took a while to come around on. But even then, I felt like I could fully appreciate them. I felt like I could understand where Ariel was coming from, and why he wrote them. I just respectfully didn't like them all that much. Ah, uh, but then next came A Tomb All Your Own. This song, in all of my sad, mopey isolation, was my theme song for a long time. I felt just every inch of it deeply resonating throughout my soul. In that jam section, it almost felt like I was being cast out to sea, sent out to drift along the stormy stream that was my consciousness. And then the song seemed to rematerialize, restabilize, and Ariel called my attention back with the line, a thousand miles out at sea, with no more walls to call me free. It was just so perfect. It was another example of a song sounding how I felt. It seemed to capture the very feeling of sitting in my room alone for hours on end, scrolling endlessly through YouTube and the internet, my social skills atrophying away as time seemed to melt from my body. And then, just as I was really getting into darkly reflecting on my situation, uh, Hello, uh, this, uh, this is Victor. Uh, hey, hey, come on, come on, come by, cause, um, I... It was like the stupidest thing, and yet I absolutely love this song. I kind of, like, wanted to be into more hard rock at the time. I, like, wasn't. I wasn't really into it. Not that I disliked it, I just didn't really have any I liked. But I wanted to be this hard rock guy. I thought it was so cool. And so the song started off with this sample of Minor Threat, which I didn't even know at the time. And I really thought that was so cool. And then it just had this other 20 seconds of, like, a voicemail that I think Ariel got that was meant for someone else. And it was just the funniest thing. I used to laugh so hard at everything about this album. And it was just so perfect to me. The same way that I talk about the songs that I didn't like adding to the album, this weird experimental spoken word interlude seemed to just make the album seem so much more real and so much more perfect to me. Nowadays, when I'm not musing about Ariel Pink, I spend most of my time writing. 
And a big part of my writing philosophy is that you shouldn't just conform to one tone, because that's not what human existence is like, man. We're not ever just sad or just happy, at least I'm not. It's usually a mixture of the two. It's usually a mixture of being sad or hurt or left reeling from something and yet finding a kind of sickly but hilarious black irony in it all that you can't help smiling about. That's the side of humanity that Fast Forward and Scared Famous speak to for me. What's the next song? Uh, Kitchen Club? Oh yeah, I don't like it. I'ma be real with you guys, I don't think I've ever listened to this song in full. Uh, yeah, don't fucking tag me. Nails emoji, crown emoji, eyes emoji. The Lament of Edward Boggles is another song that I always used to and still do retreat into whenever I'm feeling unsure of myself. It's a song I can only describe as feeling warm, and it was one of the only songs that I fully understood the lyrics to on first listen. In fact, my first time listening to it, I remember vividly visualizing what I imagined Edward Boggles to look like, to be like, and all of these stories that I could imagine playing out around the character. Tracks 14 through 18 crying, talking all of the time, girl in a tree, Jesus Christ came to me in a dream, and one more time, were all these anthems that I would constantly hum to myself. They were all very catchy and they all felt like they created worlds that I just wanted to live in. Worlds that listening to the song could transport me to at any time, and I would frequently take advantage of that, taking trips there whenever I pleased. And finally, the closer to this set of songs, May the Music Never Die, was always a personal song of triumph of mine. The love of music, music being something that really affected my life and dug into my soul, was something I was just starting to explore. So having this ode to the beauty of music, to the soundtracks that light up my life as they say in the lyrics, really spoke to me very deeply. It always moved me and still sometimes makes me embarrassingly misty-eyed in the middle of the college dining hall that I'm listening into it. And the second disc of this fantastic double album, Scared Famous, was something that would take me another year or two to get into, and while I still love it and absolutely adore all the songs, I don't have as many poetic associations to them. Some of the songs are really fantastic. Baby Comes Around always felt like a great tune to bring you back into it after the sublime beauty that is May the Music Never Die. It's a kind of slow, warpy, but also surprisingly upbeat and very fun pop tune. And then as if the skies are darkening around you, it dips down into the facts of destiny, which is even warpier and slower and more freaked out. This is a song that really just sounds like carnival music. I really don't think I'll ever hear another song that quite sounds like the mix of facts of destiny on this album. You'd think that privacy would be another anthem for someone as emotional and isolated as myself, but I just more liked it because it rocked, man. Those two refrains, they still make me bob my head and rock out wherever I'm listening to it. The first First one where Ariel sings, I'm happy alone, and then the second one where he goes, wah, 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 along to it. They feel so celebratory and so fun, almost like a celebration of being alone. Passing the Pedal to You, Beverly Kills, and Why Can't I Be Me are all fantastic songs, and each one probably spent four months as my favorite Ariel Pink song, respectively, but I just don't have a lot to say about them. Something Isn't Something, though, it's a song very special to my heart. It took me a while to get into this one. For the longest time, I would always skip it. But now, whenever it comes on, I can't help getting all wishy-washy. I've always been a very romantic, over-emotional person, and for years and years of my life, I had no one to share that with. It felt utterly devastating. And this song, for the longest time, always made my fiery, burning, romantic half feel very at peace. The next song, Express, Confess, Cover Up, I'm sorry, this is my other hot take for the album. I know how people love this song, and like, I can appreciate what it is, but it just doesn't do it for me. It doesn't really go anywhere, and I never really like, listen to it and I'm like, oh, I want to listen to that again, as I am with most of the album's songs. The next song, though, the cover of Birds in My Tree, it was always a favorite of mine. It sounds so unique even in the context of the album, it almost feels like a reggae cover of what was this 60s psychedelia song. I always loved it so much. That cover is followed by another two covers, She Don't Know What To Do With Herself, an R. Stevie Moore cover, and Moya, a cover of a band called Southern Death Cult, and they always just felt like such quintessential rock songs to me. These songs always felt to me like rips of obscure 1960s 45s, and I love it. And oh hey, look, next up is my twin, Stevie Pink JavaScript, 
and it's just such a perfect fit for this album. Not only is it a collaboration with R. Stevie Moore that once again just sounds like nothing else out there, I dare you to find me a song that sounds even close to Stevie Pink JavaScript, but it just so perfectly fits the album's mission statement. Its lyrics are a silly, surreal, free association, but they occasionally touch on very real feelings, feelings of inadequacy and failure. Yet it's also riotously funny through all of that. It feels like the song is telling a story, both literally through its lyrics and emotionally. It has that sort of progression to it, and it was always something that really entranced me. The following track, R. Stevie's Brain, while fantastic, almost feels like a cool down from the overpowering six and a half minutes of pure pop ecstasy you just heard. The next three tracks, Spires in the Snow, I Wanna Be Young, and Go Pa Kapu Ko, were all longtime favorites of mine. These were songs that I would sneak my MP3 player into summer camp just to listen to. Each one is so different, but they're all so infectious and they have such hummable lyrics. They all sound like non-existent pop hits from decades before that you've heard long ago but can't quite place. And I just love that. They feel like they completely connect me to the other dimension that Ariel's music feels like it comes from sometimes. And of course next up is Hoist Interlude, the greatest song ever recorded. This one requires no further explanation. After you've replayed the greatest song ever 15 or so times, it's only natural that you'll go to the next song, Scared Famous. This song I always really loved. It almost felt like it was leading into a climax of the album, or perhaps winding down to a great ending. Scared Famous, this album's namesake, almost feels like a triumphant victory lap. It rocks, it's fun, it's cool, it's a little bit sweet. It takes its time, it lingers, but it's perfect and never overstays its welcome. It's a great headbanger, and it's a song I always love listening to, and usually have to replay a second or third time. And finally, this grand journey into pop bliss ends with Death Crush 99, an over 10 minute rock and roll jam full to the brim with everything Ariel Pink and his music stood for at the time. It's bizarre, it's unique, it's very silly but it's got a lot of heart. It has a lot of pained, sad emotions in it, but it looks through those emotions and creates beauty out of them. I may not have listened to this song for another year after discovering Ariel Pink through Fast Forward, but it perfectly crystallizes everything I loved about his music. Death Crush 99 absolutely rocks, through Ariel Pink's bizarre punk rock cynicism, yet full level of emotion, he goes on to make something better than anyone chasing the trends or acting directly against the trends could ever make. And the album ends with the same silly, strung out sound effect that it began with 38 songs ago. It then devolves and breaks down into stringy guitar feedback, be before ending with a few notes on a bass and a single strum for the guitar. This always felt to me like the song had sped up so fast that it crashed into a tree. And I think that's kind of the perfect way to end this statement thematically. If we go back to Ariel Pink talking about his original musical project being his sort of way of screaming into the void trying to prove he could exist, this grand, varied album almost feels like his brightest flame, burning of course half as long. There's so many more feelings swirling around in my head about this album, so many more things it means to me that I can't fully crystallize into any earthling language if I tried. Instead of that though, I will urge you, the listener, if you've never listened to this album, or only listened to it once or twice, or maybe never in its original form, to go to the description. Above all the stupid things I have to say, and even the track list, I've put a link to download the album. It's a brand new rip made by none other than Slugbug himself of the album in a pristine wave format. Listen to it, it'll change your goddamn life. This new wave rip, while it may not seem like it adds much to the album, being very thinly mixed, it gives the album every instrument on it so much more room to breathe. That metallic twangy synthesizer that makes up the heart of the album's sound has so much more room to exist, and the thin psychedelic syrup that the album sounds like coalesces into something so much more goopy and beautiful that will overtake your very brain.
Scared Famous slash Fast Forward is the only one of R.E.L. Pink's albums that was never officially released until the archives reissues. Despite this, it's had probably the greatest impact out of any of his albums, save for maybe the doldrums, on not only his fans, but a generation of artists who would go on to be influenced by his work. Even though its sweeping 38 tracks were far too much of a task for any label in the mid-2000s to handle, Scared Famous slash Fast Forward has appeared online through Soulseek many times. The fact that it's only been bootlegged and uploaded to websites as rips of CDRs and tapes acts as a sort of filter for Ariel's greatest fans. It was only ever found by those seeking more, who wanted more of Ariel's madness, and thus it was able to influence those which it would have the most power over. Quickly, once it was discovered, word spread of it through sites like Mousespace and other YouTube comment sections as this great hidden gem of Ariel's work. Scared Famous slash Fast Forward quickly became a rite of passage for all Ariel Pink fans. And it's easy to see why. The album is strange and inaccessible and beautiful and has some of Ariel's most fantastic melodies. In an interview I did years ago with Peter Karlovich of O Ecstasy, he described the album as sounding like hellish carnival music sung over by a barbershop quartet of the damned. Still though, I have a hard time believing the album's strangeness is its only appeal to artists. It's not just Trout Mask Replica for the new millennium. Something I noticed about this album while making this video, it's the only one of Ariel Pink's albums that doesn't have a concrete theme, a concrete aesthetic. The doldrums with all its keyboard-bathed dark harmonies sounds like a night spent in a rainy, magical forest. House Arrest is a jangly folk pop album on acid, and Worn Copy is a molten hot trip through the annals of the human psyche. Scared Famous and Fast Forward though? They don't have one feel, they don't conform to one aesthetic. They're Ariel Pink's White Album, his mission statement. They include brand new songs, covers of some of his all-time favorites, collaboration tracks, and even a recording he made when he was 12 years old. It's a very free and unique listen. It almost sounds like a retrospective on Ariel's life to the point, and I think that's the most influential point of it. It's complete, unrestricted, unrestrained creativity. Creativity not out of spite or sarcasm, but solely out of love for music. It's art made solely for art's sake, Art that sounds like nothing out there and nothing will ever sound like it again. And I think that's why, even though the album has never, ever in its past 20 years been released in its original intended tracklist, and probably never will because no record label has the balls to release an album like this. Despite that fact, it will still continue to connect to the people who listen to it for generations to come, influencing their creativity, or just teaching them how to be themselves without even saying it outright. That's the beauty of this album. That's why I fell in love with it, and that's why you should listen to it too if you haven't already. Well, that just about wraps it up, doesn't it? Oh, who am I kidding? I know there's one last big question that's been burning away in all of your minds, and let's just get it right out in the open. Let's address the elephant in the room. If Fast Forward and Scared Famous were two women of equal attractiveness, which one would I do? Now this is an important question that I myself have thought long and hard on. My immediate knee-jerk response is to say Scared Famous, of course. I mean, she would be more slick, more cool, a bit more gothic, a bit more interesting. But I don't know if Scared Famous as a person and I would completely jive together, you know? Like, a good relationship, I think, is based on being almost completely intertwined in sensibilities with who you're with. Someone who you just feel completely gets you, gets your view of the world, and vice versa for that person. And I just feel like Scared Famous and I would disagree on too many fundamental philosophical issues, you know? I feel like Scared Famous is more focused on her style and what she should do more than anything. And that's not really something that I could get down with in a long-term, lasting relationship, if I'm being completely honest. Sure, she's got a lot of cool songs, like the Moya cover and Death Crush 99, of course, and she's got a lot of interesting covers, but I just don't think that at the end of the day we get along too well. And then I got to thinking about how Fast Forward really feels like she would be made for me, you know? And it would almost feel like a, a childhood friend of mine. Maybe that comes from the fact that I first listened to Fast Forward. It was my first R.E.L. Pink record. And everything about Fast Forward just feels so completely tailored to my sensibilities. I think Fast Forward would be the perfect girl for me if she existed. Aw, you've always been there for me, haven't you, baby? Mwah. You'd never break up with me and tell me that you were moving too fast, would you? You'd never tell me that even though you really loved me, you couldn't bear to date a man, could you? <laughs> That's all you guys think. <laughs> this video, this video that I'm speaking at the end of now, has been in the making for just about two years. 
It's funny just how much can happen in two years, really. The making of this video has seen me through some really tough times in my life, as well as some much better ones. And there's something you should know about me. When I'm depressed, when I'm really going through it in life, I listen to a lot of Smashing Pumpkins, like a lot, a lot of Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, like more Porcelina of the Vast Oceans than any one man should safely be consuming. And it was during one of these down, depressed periods that I was in my room listening to the aeroplane flies high, and I realized something. It's a really fantastic song, but god, it's so depressing to listen to, it made me want to slit my wrists, it's such a heavy song, it felt like it was dragging me down. In that moment, I decided to queue up next Ghost Town by Ariel Pink's on Graffiti, off the album Underground, and it kind of had the opposite effect. It's a very dark, scary song. I once described it on Mouse Face as feeling as though a ghostly dagger were piercing my soul while black storm clouds swirl ahead. But it didn't make me feel depressed, you know? It didn't drag me further down. In fact, it had the opposite effect. When I finished listening to it, I felt sort of cleansed. I felt as though that sadness had washed over me and completely exited my being. And I think this is a superpower that a lot of Ariel's music has. There's an interview for the liner notes of the Kitchen Club albums where Ariel Pink says that at the time of Warren Copy, his music came from all the dark, depressing, depraved parts of the human soul that you weren't supposed to show. That he was writing this poppy, driving rock and roll music communicating the parts of himself that he was supposed to hide away from humanity. While when most artists do this, it may be to show the things that society doesn't want to hear, man, to show the parts of their humanity that are just too much for society. I don't think this was Ariel's intention when making Warren Copy, and many of his other songs like that for that matter. In another one of those Kitchen Club interviews, Ariel Pink describes the song The Ballad of Bobby Pin as like an exorcism of all of his bad traits. This one long jam where he just wanted to trance out all of his self-destructive tendencies. And I think his music has a lot of that effect for people listening. It's something that's stuck with me my whole life. It's the reason I keep going back to his music. It may have never been released in its true original track listing, but I think there's something kind of beautiful about that. The fact that both the album ended up finding the fans on its own, and the fact that the fans found the album on its own. It almost just makes sense that this art willed into existence, made from such raw emotion, found its audience, and that its audience found it, in the end, against all odds. I guess I just feel really fortunate to live in the world where we did find it. Thank you guys for watching and for sticking with this channel so much all these years. It really means the world to me. I hope you all have a fantastic night, and may the music never die. Got confused there for a second. Triphonics for dummies, Jimmy.